Ugh. Hello guys, you can call me Zero, and this is the daddy of them all. It's Grand Prix World. It's only about fucking time as well. Uh, it's taken me over 12 months to actually get this season together. Just a moment, let's get rid of that. The first thing you'll probably notice is that it looks a bit like arse. Um, there's not really much I can do about that at the moment. I've toyed around and I've played around as much as possible trying to get this to look as good on the output as I can but it's such an old game I mean it, it surprised me actually to recall it's almost 20 years old now um, which makes it all the more tragic that nothing better has come out between today and the day it came out um, so it will look pretty bad um, you're probably not getting the sound either there's two reasons for that one there is no volume control within the menu it's just it's not a thing and to minimize the game in order to play around with the sound levels which are only vaguely in relation to the volume that actually comes out from the game um, it crashes the game it's it's very unstable on Windows 7 um, some a member of the community I believe patched it so that it would it would run but it runs in the looser sense of the word so I'm afraid I can't really make it look or sound much better for you but I think it's really important that if you've never played this game or you've spent time wishing that you had a decent management simulation to get your teeth into you need to see this basically this is the daddy um, now obviously some people are going to say that's bullshit um, <laughs> The uh, EAF on Manager Games were also really good. They, they were. Um, I have to give them credit for fully rendering everything in, in 3D, um, which which does help. Um, but the actual the level of the simulation, the, the detail of the simulation, was just completely lacking compared to something like this. Um, this is a game that evolves over 10, 10 seasons, so you play 10 seasons and it's game over. Um, and your technological process isn't static, so... I'll show you when we dive in, but basically an advantage can't really be locked in, and so you always have to stay on top of your game. Um, let's dive in. Who the hell is that guy? Let's do it properly or not at all. Okay, so um, another thing you'll probably notice is that that isn't Jacques Villeneuve. Um, that's because for some reason he wasn't able to appear in the game. I'm not entirely sure why. I think it's some kind of licensing issue. The other thing you'll have noticed is that the game is in German. Um, I'm sorry about that. It's because obviously I am living in Germany. And getting your hands on an official copy of this game is incredibly difficult. And I just I simply couldn't find an English language version um, here. It, it just It was not something I could get my hands on. And given that... I did find an English language version on the UK version of eBay selling for £75. You can understand my dilemma. Um, everything on this channel is obviously going to be free. I'm not going to slam any adverts on there. I'm not interested in making money. Um, I don't think it's. I don't think the quality of the output is going to be high enough to justify wasting your time with with ads. So we'll try and avoid that as much as possible. Um, let's get in. So obviously this is based around the 1998 season. Williams, Ferrari, Benetton, McLaren, Jordan, Prost, Sauber, Arrow, Stewart, Tyrrell and Minardi. Now, originally I wanted to play as either Tyrrell or Minardi, simply because I have a lot of love for both of those teams, and I think it would be interesting to take you through the development from a, a back-of-the-grid team to something more in the midfield, or maybe even at the front of the grid. But the reason I'm not going to do that is that Two of the greatest challenges this game can offer you, and the most rewarding challenges, is not just surviving, but progressing as Tyrrell and Minardi. And I've had close to 20 years to play the absolute balls off this game. Um, and so, I don't want to take that away from you by showing you how I would get through the difficult first two seasons. It's something that you need to experience, I think, if you're going to get into this game. So instead, I'm going to pick Arrows, which is possibly my favourite team of all time. Um, so we're still going to be down at the back of the grid. Um, the budget's a little bit larger, obviously. Um, but it's not going to be as difficult to survive that first season. There's still going to be a challenge. It's not a team with a lot of money. Um, 
and obviously this is the air this is the era where arrows had just recently been taken over i believe two years previously and this is where that initial sort of seed money from the new owner and the investors was starting to be a bit thinner on the ground also this is the season that they purchased brian hart engines and um were essentially manufacturing their own engines which was a risky strategy which as you can probably tell by the fact they're not with us today didn't really pay off um so our drivers for the first season are Diniz and Salo. Got a lot of love for Pedro Diniz. Uh, as pay drivers go, he's probably the, the big king. And Mika Salo, who doesn't like Mika Salo? Uh, it's just not possible. Uh, then Emmanuel Collard, is, he almost went to Prost sometime around 98-99. He's a young French driver. He never really broke through, um, but he, he tested fairly frequently, I believe. I think he ended up in uh, endurance racing, but I could be completely wrong. So, this first episode, I'm just going to go through building our team. So we're going to spend this this first 15, 20 minutes, or however long I end up waffling on, um, just going through the interface, showing you what you can actually um, manage, what the core of the game is, and then the next episode we'll hit qualifying for Australia, and then I'll probably separate the race into a separate video, because... I'll be honest with you, normally when I play this game, I allow the races and qualifying to simulate off screen because I've always felt my interference from the pit wall has only ever hindered my performance. But obviously, we're here to showcase the game, so you're going to have to see that kind of stuff. You're going to have to uh, be able to appreciate the glory that is this game. Um, so, the first tab here is obviously your team overview, uh, your name, you've got your budget at the moment. That is fluid, don't think of that as a as a budget for the season. You will have money coming in on a race by race basis, depending on your performance and how your sponsors feel. Um, also, you can lose money depending on how you spend it. Uh, we have the news here, which I will happily translate for you. Um, now, actually, already, that's interesting. The first thing you can um, see down at the bottom here is one of the best features of the game for me. Um, in 1998, ESO were not I believe an official fuel supplier, and I don't believe they, I don't believe they were in F1 actually until 2001 with Toyota. But feel free to correct me. Um, they are planning to enter F1 next season. So when it comes to negotiating our fuel supply for next year, we're going to have an extra possible supplier. Likewise, it's also possible for companies to pull out. So, you know, I've had games where Mercedes-Benz have decided to completely pull out of engine production, and so that leaves, you know, if you're, if you've got, a, say, a, a works or partner deal with um, with an engine supplier, and they decide to pull out, that can cause serious problems because there's a limited number of sort of preferential contracts. Um, how it works with your main three suppliers, tires, fuel, and uh, engines, is there are three levels. The first level being customer. This is just where you hand over some money, they hand over engines. You're not going to get priority for upgrades. You, your upgrades are probably going to be fairly few and far between. But if you don't have the staff to negotiate those bigger contracts, it's often better to um, avoid fighting fights you can't win and instead agree to pay for, pay for your engines in the off chance that you can spend that time and resources trying to get a cash injection from a, a different sponsor. Um, the second level is, is partner. That's where you don't pay anything for the engines, but they don't give you anything other than the engines either. And then the deal that you really want to be chasing, especially if you want to uh, win the championship, which is as true in real life as it is in the game, you need a works deal. And that's where you are not necessarily the only, uh, like you might be today with sort of Red Bull and Renault, um, but you are the preferred or one of two preferred partners for uh, an engine manufacturer, which means they give you the engines, they give you a whole bunch of sponsorship money, and all their resources are thrown behind your team. So they will take your testing input and build the engine to your spec. And you can end up with a completely different engine to other people using uh, the same engine supplier, simply through your own initiative and what your engineers discover. So that's a fantastic feature. It's really really vital if you're planning to um, to fight at the front of the grid. I have won with a partner engine deal before, but it, you're, you're setting yourself up for a much bigger challenge than you actually need to. Um, following on, you've got the email inbox, nothing just yet because nothing's happened. Uh, this is your, um, your budget and a budget projection. So obviously you can see not much going on at the moment, but that will change. 
and then here is the staff screen. Um, now, what you'll see here is Deniz is a pay driver, so that negative red sum there is just showing that every season he's with us at the moment, he's paying us 9.6 million. And the bulk of our budget for this season is coming from Deniz. I mean, he's paying Mikasalo's salary, he's paying Emmanuel Collard's salary. Um, I imagine he's paying, yeah, John Barnard's on 2 million a year because he's one of, in my opinion, one of the best designers um, and engineers to be ever within the F1 world. Um, what you see here is obviously the commercial department for negotiating sponsors, uh, design department, construction department and your mechanics, that's like your race team, um, pit crew, etc. Um, down here you've got uh, an overview of the employees that that department has. So uh, obviously up here you've got sort of experts, very good, good, uh, below average to poor and uh, Lehrling is like um, apprentice. So you might be wondering why would you bother having any of these lower quality workers and eventually obviously you want to phase them all out with the exception of apprentices and the reason for that is you can see here you can get star workers which tends to happen more often with apprentices and that means suddenly if you have a star apprentice you're getting the work of a much higher standard uh, staff member but for a fraction of the cost so I I'll give you one tip that's I never ever ever hire or fire apprentices I just keep that number where it is. Other people will tell you to minimize, have only five apprentices or whatever. Everyone's got their own strategy, but I've never struggled by retaining the apprentices I begin with. It's never never been a problem. So uh, the next uh, sort of columns up here, you see who the manager of that department is. Uh, this is his skill level, that, that bar there. And obviously you see uh, his Beteiligung is... Um, is commission so at the moment he's taking two percent of the value of all contracts he negotiates plus he's getting a flat rate of uh, 176 thousand dollars a year um, as his pay uh, up at the top is the cost of the department to the team the morale which affects the uh, overall effectiveness which you see over here so at the moment it's running at 100 percent efficiency but you can get it much higher than that i believe it goes up to 150 percent and that is uh, that based on this, the quality of your staff, but also the quality of your team lead. Um, so obviously if you have a five star team lead, he's gonna act sort of like a, a multiplier to the quality of the rest of the department and you can actually end up with a fairly cheap department managed very effectively that's producing results that you would otherwise have to spend a lot of money to replicate. Um, and then you've got design, construction, and, and mechanics, as we've already been over. Now, especially with drivers, um, if you're in the uh, situation like we are, where having a pay driver is beneficial, you're going to want to try and pick up drivers on the first round. It's just, there's obviously going to be a lot of competition for drivers who are willing to hand over a significant amount of money to fund your team. And so you want to get in there and grab them quick. If later on when you're in the midfield and you want to pull off maybe a sort of Damon Hill to Arrows coup, what you can wait and see for is, does a big driver get dropped by one of the top teams? And is it getting towards the end of the season and that guy hasn't got a drive? Or has he even been out for a season because no one signed him? That then increases the chance that he'll sign for you. There are a lot of factors, obviously how much you're willing to pay, your chances of winning the championship, the strength of... Um, of your financial package and um, the conditions within the team so some drivers will not work with a pay driver uh, you've got to find this out for yourself I don't want to spoil any challenge for anybody I can't recommend this game enough but it's just something to bear in mind that there are a lot of factors and you can see what often appear to be unbelievable driver changes that when you really dig into it aren't all that unbelievable if you look at how they came to pass the level of the simulation is, is just fantastic um, so, as I say, you can see what we're paying out or having paid into us um, as a basic wage. Then uh, a race win bonus, uh, a championship bonus, when their last season is, so they're all on the final season of the contract. 
Uh, this shows who their replacement will be if you've signed one. And then down here you've got their skills. Um, you know, speed, skill, overtaking, bad weather, concentration, etc. It's all it's all here. Um, their age, nationality, and then just some, some basic stats about how many uh, points races they've had, how many pole positions, fastest laps, etc. Um, now because Deniz is kind of underwriting the team at the moment, I think we want to go ahead and try and get him on for probably another two seasons just so we've got that safety safety net um, we don't want to make him our number one driver but he won't likewise in that position take a number two driver slot especially because he's currently an equal first driver so we have to kind of maintain the quality of the offer to him I'm going to offer him for, for two seasons he might request for, th for, th for three and then we lose a turn in which other teams can offer him a contract as well so it's not the end of the world if he rejects this offer, but it is risky. It's very dangerous um, because obviously teams like Minardi and Tyrrell would love that sort of cash injection and they could just hit an, an offer to him while we're doing qualifying, for example. And you come back and find he's not willing to negotiate with you anymore. So with that in mind, I'm going to throw an offer of a $5,000 bonus for each of these things just on the off chance that, hey, you never know, maybe we get lucky. Let's see what he says. Okay, so he wants a longer contract. That's a bit of a pisser, but we'll get through it. Um, now, I'm going to try as well to get another pay driver. Or at least I would. Uh, what I discovered was, unless you can sign two pay drivers within the same turn, they often won't work together. And getting two pay drivers at a team for a season can actually be surprisingly difficult. So the guy I'm looking at is going to be Shinji Nakano. Um, he didn't actually do very well in real F1, but I found he's actually a very passable driver um, in Grand Prix World. So he's someone I can recommend. He, he's one of the lower paying pay drivers. Um, I believe he might actually be the lowest paying pay driver, but still, that's almost three million. That's definitely not going to hurt. It's twice the uh, money that we have to start with. So no problems there. Um, let's see who else we want to hire. I'd like to keep John Barnard, but to be honest with you, the cost of keeping him, all these figures will have to increase. Uh, he's going to need more pay, bigger bonus. I'm not sure we really want to fight with him on that, especially because between this season and next season, he might even lose a skill point. If the team's performing badly, as it's likely to do, um, he could end up losing a skill point. What I'm going to do with that in mind is for less than a quarter of the price initially, I'm going to try and pick up Harvey Postlethwaite from Tyrrell, who is, as anyone who listens to me and Simon Waffle on, you'll know he's probably my favourite designer in F1 history. I'm going to try and get him for two seasons. I've got a feeling he's going to turn us down initially, but you never know, maybe we get lucky. Okay, so we don't have enough sponsors to keep him happy at the moment. The wages aren't high enough and he needs a longer contract. Um, okay, we'll come back to you, Harvey. You sit tight. Um, designer. Designer is where I feel it's worth spending your money more than any other department. But that said, they command some serious wages in most cases. Um, the cheapest three star is Mike Gascoigne. He's actually... Not far off being half price of Mike Coughlin, who we have at the moment. So I'm going to try and... I'll give him a big pay increase, but we'll still be saving 100000 this season. And I'll try and get him for two seasons. And let's see what what he says. Ah, excellent. So he's agreed to come to us for 1999. That means no one else can sign him now. We don't care if the guy we have is, is signed away by another team. We're not going to end up with some no-mark amateur running the show. Um... Where I don't feel it's worth spending money is your commercial manager. Simply because because of the nature of the game where you continually have to up the commission that you're offering to them, you're going to end up giving away most of the money that your sponsors offer you if you're not careful. I mean, 5% doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're running a small team on a tight budget, losing 5% of all your sponsorship money is actually often not worth it. Um... So I would never go over 5%. Ever, ever, ever. And the only guy who's probably willing to take a 3% deal is going to be Rob Armstrong at Stewart. 
he might come to us. I'm not convinced. But you should always roll the dice. You know, the worst that happens is he knocks you back. So he wants uh, uh, probably an extra percent. Which I, I could I could deal with, but really never go over five percent. It just it just is not worth it. Um, and three hundred sixty four thousand, we could probably absorb giving him a little bit more than that. But I'd be reluctant initially to spend that much money. Um, now the mechanics. This it's actually in this department. It's not difficult to get a top level guy for a relatively modest amount of money. Um, let's push the boat out and we'll go for uh, Carolyn Shaw from Benetton. Um, it's a massive increase on what we're spending now, but it will help us overall by... You, what you're doing is you're multiplying by a factor of four the skill of your pit crew. And obviously, as you know, time lost in pit stops is a real problem. But also in this game, you've got the opportunity to copy driver aids from rival teams and being a team the size of arrows you don't really if you're playing smart have the resources to develop your own driver aids you know we're talking active suspension servo brakes that kind of stuff um, so what you will really want to be doing is poaching it from other teams and it seems like a, a big increase in spend right now but over the cost of developing and building driver aids if you can wipe out that research and development cost, um, this is probably going to work out to be a smart investment. So we'll try and get him for just a season, actually, because he's sort of he's diving below his level. To be honest, and I don't think he'd agree to stay with us. Yeah, he's happy with coming for a year, but he needs us to have more sponsors, and we're not paying him enough. So this is the problem when you're trying to um, poach bigger name guys. Um, I'm not going to hire any extra staff for commerce. Actually, maybe I will, actually. We'll hire one expert. That's a massive investment, really, for a single staff member. But what it seems to me is we're going to be in a very difficult position if we can't attract someone um, a bit more impressive. And for that, we're going to need the sponsors. This video is dragging out forever, isn't it? Um, okay, so this is an overview of um, basically your your race car operations. Um, this is we've got 100% of our mechanics available this turn. We've got three chassis. Uh, these are their rolls, and you can see they've got no use and no damage on them, and they're upgraded to the the highest level our tech currently allows. Here you can um, repair wear and tear. Here you will repair race damage. Um, as a smaller team, you will run out of spare parts. It's just going to happen, and you begin to make judgments about whether you actually want to qualify for races, or whether it's better to save the parts for more important races you've got a better chance of performing well at. And you know, you can end up having to push drivers out on wet tyres in a dry qualifying session just to make sure you don't make the grid. It's it's kind of counterintuitive, and we'll definitely run up. We'll run up to that over the course of the playthrough, I think. Um, Something else to bear in mind is if you're not doing testing, then race car 3 won't actually pick up any uh, wear and tear. So you can, if you avoid testing as you should for teams like Minardi and Tyrrell in your first season, you can sort of extend the lifetime of all three cars by rotating how they're used and who's using them, how, uh, how wild you let your drivers go in each session. Uh, this is your testing overview. Um, we're not going to do any testing at the moment, but I will come to that later. Uh, here is the technology of um, of the car, I suppose. So you've got you know brakes, etc. Uh, the bar on the left is um, sort of general quality, like how well it performs, and the bars on the right is reliability. So you can see already we're going to have a very serious reliability problem. Um, with stuff like you know fuel flow, hydraulics, um, suspension, it's the car's not really going to to be a stayer. Um, and the problem there is that if you do have a failure, then that classes as damage rather than wear and tear, and so you're going to end up going through your spare parts much faster. So I'll take that into consideration, and we'll probably have our drivers take it very very easy 
uh, for the initial races until maybe we can get some of those numbers up. Uh, this is the design for our 1999 chassis. Uh, we haven't started it yet, obviously. This question mark in the top right just shows you that the regulations for next season haven't been confirmed by the FIA yet. So I can start to design a car, but you might waste time and money developing a design that suddenly is illegal and you have to scrap it. Um, so often, as a, as a bigger team, you probably wouldn't waste your time because you can develop a car much faster, but for a small team, you really do have to take the risk. So straight away, we're gonna put 50% of our designers working on next year's car. There are four stages to development. So you've got the basic design, then you've got the CFD simulation, then you've got model testing. Um, so you build a model and you refine it, and then you scale the model up. And then finally, there's wind tunnel testing of the final build. Um, this bar to uh, on the left side, uh, labelled Einrichtung, is basically at the facilities your team operates from, have you got any technology, any facilities that you've built that will increase the efficiency of this stage of development? So have you got your own wind tunnel? Have you built a supercomputer to deal with your simulation? Uh, the next bar along is how far progressed each stage is. Now, with everything to do with design, you want to fill all these bars maximum if you can. If you can't because time's getting away from you then you have to make sacrifices but it's better to make sacrifices later in development. So if you're halfway through the season and you haven't filled the first bar don't worry you've got to stick with it because this top bar the, the Entwurf is the most important bar to have full and then the CFD simulation if you can fill that that's the second most important third and fourth obviously they're all important to different degrees but the biggest impact on how well your car performs is making sure that first box is full uh, this is 1998 chassis so based on your testing you can discover handling and performance problems with the car and this is where you design components that fix them this is where you upgrade the technology that we've already discussed and this is where you develop driver aids. I'm sorry I am rushing through some of these things because we're going to go into more detail throughout the season. Um, over here this is control of our engineers so this is where you build spare parts, you build driver aids, you build new chassis. Um, now you assign engineers here but you'll also have a um, percentage number of how far along those the people you assign can get you and you need to have the uh, Fertigstellung um, or I suppose the level of completeness um, at 100% because you can't build over the course of two turns so you can't 50% build a 1998 car and then finish it the next round you have to completely build it within one round so you always have to be very careful when it comes to monitoring your staff. Down here is the contracts we have for our engine, tires, and fuel. And you see the quality of whatever it is you're sourcing, uh, which version. So this is the first race engine of the season from Hart, which we technically own, but for some reason we're a customer. And you can see we're not getting upgrades, we're not helping with research and development, and we're not a priority for them. So this might be the only version of this engine we receive all year they might not bother developing it. But you can see it's a Hart V10 for 1998. XX here means it's simply generic, and 01A just means it's the very first version. Um, if those two Xs change to AR, then that means it's an Arrow-specific engine that we've designed, um, or, or at least had an input of the design. Um, but that isn't going to happen, simply because we're not a works partner. Uh, tires we're getting from Bridgestone. We have one compound for it for hard, soft, uh, intermediate, and full wet. Um, statistically, they don't look too bad for a 1998 tyre, so that's that's pretty good. Uh, we're still paying for it, though. And then we are assisting with R&D with ELF, who are our fuel supplier. Um, but you can see here that while the fuel is very uh, good for reliability, it's very easy on the engine, the power it produces is very, very poor. Um, so we will when it comes to testing, probably have to spend some time testing to provide development points for the fuel so that we can try and address that balance, if not improve uh, the overall quality of the fuel. And then finally, you've got the factory. We have a level one factory, 
Um, we've not got a CAD or CAM facility, we don't have a supercomputer, a testing rig, wind canal or a workshop. So we're basically working with the absolute bare minimum. There are five levels for each upgrade and if I upgrade our CAD to level 5, it will be level 5 next season but over time it will degrade as technology goes on so this isn't a final investment. This is an investment that you you will have an obligation if you want to stay competitive to spend more money on later down the line and you can see a level 1 factory can only have two up upgrades so if we were to build a CAD and CAM facilities um, to whatever level we chose that would use up those two slots and we would have to spend 1.6 million to upgrade to a bigger factory which would also give us more staff um, so making that investment is actually one of the hardest calls in the game um, to make because you're signing yourself up for a huge initial investment plus a huge ongoing investment and you have to be sure that the efficiency you gain from having extra staff and facilities is offset and used to um, suck more resources into the team to make sure that it's financially viable. Finally, uh, this is the sponsorship overview. So we can take a look here and as you can see not looking particularly great because it is 20 years old and um, it doesn't render all that well on a Windows 7 computer but these are our sponsors you'll notice they are all real world sponsors that's another amazing feature of the game um, these will all I believe be up at the end of this year so if we look at next year's car yeah it's completely blank that's not always the case you can negotiate multi-year deals but here you can see an overview of how much they're paying you each season, when the last season is, what they're giving you, and this here is your relationship with them. The better your relationship, the more money they will give you. Um, they will continue to meet their commitments. So like here, our title sponsor is Danker, who have promised us 5.2 million a year. You won't necessarily get that. That's the first thing to understand. You'll not necessarily get 5.2 million from Danker over the course of a season because your relationship with them can degrade um, and it can also be that the team just doesn't perform so they're not prepared to hand over the cash. So these are only ever really guideline kind of figures. Um, any negative figures that I believe are fixed depend, you know, pending reliability problems but the money incoming is very, very fluid and you have to sort of you can't you can't look at this this overview here and think okay I have X million to spend for sure because there's no guarantee you're going to get all of this money and you can actually end up with a relatively small fraction of it balancing your budget is actually incredibly difficult in the early early seasons as a small team um, over here you can see uh, negotiations for a new team sponsor uh, engines tires, fuel and money. We'll probably set that up next video so we don't overrun. Um, this is your hospitality overview so you can set the standard or the money you're prepared to, to um, give out for quality and uh, in catering and comfort for your VIPs and then you assign staff to sort of chaperone your VIPs and then you can give up to three invitations to different sponsors and that's how you keep your uh, relationship good. Um, as well as offsetting any relationship loss from poor performance. So certainly at Monaco, uh, you want to invite your most important sponsors and spend the maximum amount of money because that's where the biggest gain is to be made. So if you have a works engine supplier and you want to continue that relationship next season, as well as negotiating a contract with them, you really want to sweeten the deal by bringing them to Monaco, for example. Um, here you can negotiate sort of licenses for team merchandise which you don't really want to do until you've completed your sponsorship packet because the, the money you get here isn't really worthwhile and then here's obviously the usual taking a credit making investments and selling shares in the team so hopefully you can see just how in-depth this game is and hopefully uh, I've not waffled too much and put you off watching the uh, the actual playthrough of the coming seasons I don't know how far we're gonna get it depends if we uh, go out of business. It depends how well the series is uh, received by you guys. But I would appreciate your feedback. If uh, there's anything you want me to go over in more detail, uh, or if you have a preference regarding which driver I should pick up, or if you feel um, 
you want to set a challenge, like, you know, can we get, break the top five in the constructors with a customer engine deal, anything like that, any feedback you have, slam it below, whether it's personal abuse or otherwise, it's all good, we're all bros here, and uh, I will see you next time.